It's Confirmation Sunday. I've been looking forward to this. We haven't had one in a couple of years. And so we, we're recognizing our youth on their journeys of faith. This is a very special time filled with lots of opportunities and challenges. And I just want to say spending time with these guys was wonderful. Reminded me of my youth. Times of wondering with an A and wondering with an O. How many of you went to high school camps and things and church camps when, church camps when you were growing up? And I did too. And I remember longing for if God would just give me some sign, you know, while I was sitting in those beautiful mountains of western North Carolina to which we had retreated. Or I remember watching the water change into different hues on Lake Yale in central Florida during evening vespers. And I certainly remember the consciousness raising experience of going off to college and beginning to learn some things about religion that they never told me in Sunday school class. Reflecting on the faith and the journeys of our confirmands, as well as all of us, made me think again about the landmarks in the development of faith. And a lot of great work has been done in understanding the stages of human development in our lives. Scholars like Jean Puget, Eric Erickson, Lawrence Kohlberg. But one of the people that had such an influence on me in helping me understand the development of the stages of faith was Scott Peck. Remember Scott Peck? What a great author. In one of his books, I had the privilege of meeting him and having a class with him many years ago. He had just written the book, A Different Drummer, about how we can build community and save the world. And in that book, he outlines, he gives a model for the stages of faith. It's a simple model, much simpler than many others, but that means I can remember it. And yet it's also, I think, very profound. And I use it often in life when I'm dealing with people. So let me just share with you again this model, these four stages of faith. First, most young children and some adults even, fall into stage one. He calls it the chaotic, even the antisocial stage. You know, it's quite natural for children to think that the world evolves around them. Do you, do you remember this? Have you seen this? Because it doesn't take very long for them to learn the word mine. This is mine. You know, we love toddlers, and they're sweet, and they're cute. But they learn quickly also, don't they, how to get their way. And we love them despite their sometimes antisocial antics. But we never leave them alone, do we? Because if we did, they would create something like in the novel, The Lord of the Flies. But gradually, as children, you grow, you're socialized. You learn the give and the take of being in community. You can't have everything. However, Scott Peck does tell us that some children grow into adulthood without ever making it out of the chaotic antisocial stage. They stay self-centered, amoral, manipulative, governed by their own will. Oftentimes, as youth or as adults, they will end up in trouble because of this, maybe even jail. However, I want to quote you. Scott Peck wrote this in 1987. Some adults in this stage are disciplined enough to become powerful leaders, even presidents. He also says some of them become clergy, too, so I have to take that to heart, but that's a little scary. Stage two is the formal institutional phase of life. We grow up and we have to learn the rules of society, what's right, what's wrong, what's socially acceptable, in order to find our place in society and begin to enjoy the joys and the challenges of living and sharing and playing together. Now stage two can be challenging as we're young adults because it teaches us disciplines. It sets the boundaries. 
It's kind of the law and order phase. And you learn this whether you go off to college or join the military, whether you're in corporate America or the institution of marriage. So our first introduction to faith or spiritual community in this stage is typically through the institution of religion. And faith in this stage, religion is introduced to us often as rules. There's the golden rule, there's the Ten Commandments, there's the Sermon on the Mount, and God comes across kind of like a friendly uncle who wants to remind us to stay in line. He'll reward us if we'll be good, and he will gently punish us if we're not. Learning to appreciate and practice tradition is extremely important in stage two. Now adults in this stage often need, young adults and others, structured religious institutions to help them manage their lives. This is where we get creeds, so you know what to believe. We get rules, rule-oriented religion. And it's quite appealing and useful to people, especially if you're needing help with what should I believe, or if you're dealing with suffering or fears or guilt or addictions. And many people have found themselves by being a part of a strong institution. And there are strong institutional churches, some of them very fundamentalists, that are filled with folks who can give you testimonies that they were on the road to hell until they experienced or found this institution, this religion. Maybe they had a conversion experience and it brought them out of the chaos of stage one into this wonderful security of stage two. Now, a lot of us have rejected or, you know, that kind of tight theology and faith of stage two churches, churches like Calvary Chapel. But I want to say that they do help a lot of people deal with the chaos in their lives and probably in ways we cannot. Many of us were raised in those kind of structured churches, weren't we? Lots of rules and boundaries, whether Baptists, many of you were Catholic. However, after having internalized the values of our tradition, the time came for many of us when we no longer needed those external, doctrinal, institutional rules to run our lives. And so we were ready for what Scott Peck calls landmark number three, the questioning individual stage of faith. And in this phase, especially in the beginning, we're not always sure there is anything to believe in. We're not sure there is a God out there. Many people in this stage, many of our young people will define themselves as agnostic or atheist. So stage threeers don't need to believe in Moses or Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad as the authority for their life. Now on the positive side, this individual emphasis of stage three means that we're open to travel the roads less traveled. Stage three is a time to question, explore, seek, search. And when you seek and search, you develop some new interests, some new beliefs. You master new skills. You find new truths in education or business or science or the arts or faith. It almost goes without saying, but our modern society greatly values stage three questioning. It's at the heart of our college and ed university system. We want people to question and discover and be creative. Our whole education and reward system is based on it. And stage three people, although they're often highly secular and unchurched, they're also usually highly principled. In fact, they are often more moral than religious folks in stage two. When we were working to become an open and affirming congregation, 
And we were trying to change attitudes in society about human sexuality and gender identity and sexual orientation and marriage equality. Our allies, our progressive allies in that cause were more likely to be stage three secularists than stage two Christians. While the beginning of stage three is questioning, as you move along, the advanced part is seeking. And this is the time in our lives when we look for new roads of meaning, usually around middle life. In stage three, we're finding more and more of the pieces of the puzzle of life, but we're never quite sure we can put it all together. If we stay in this stage forever, we will remain rather agnostic. But if enough pieces of the puzzle come together to begin to form a whole, a worldview, then we may find ourselves entering stage four, the mystical. Now mysticism, that is a strange and difficult word to describe. It is generally understood to mean finding a sense of unity, a connection with all. The unity includes overcoming all the dualisms of life, all those differences between male and female, between the races, between gay and straight, between humans and nature, between different religions and different paths to the divine. The mystical stage is communal. It goes beyond tribal mentality, beyond nationalism, even beyond patriotism. It seeks to be a citizen of the world. Mysticism also embraces, as it gets its name, mystery, the unknown, not knowing. So you can't be in control, you just want to be part of it. In mysticism, we become better at shedding our preconceived ideas and notions so that we can learn to enjoy the journey of just discovery. It's the mystics in every religion who invite us to discover this force, this energy, this spirit, call it what you will, that is behind all things and that has the power to transform us and our world. And you can't have one without the other. We can't change the world unless we're willing to change ourselves. You can get the mystics together from all the religions, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddha, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikhs, get the mystics together in a room and there will be peace and harmony, not fighting. Well, this model that Scott Peck offers us of stages of faith I think it has good news and bad news for Church of the Foothills. Most churches function, function best at stage two, that formal institutional phase, with some mysticism. Many churches, though, aren't very good at embracing the questioning agnostic stage three phase. Conversely, I think it's fair to say, we at Church of the Foothills, we're very good at the questioning stage. Would you agree? We're also trying to grow into stage four mystical communal. Yet we're not good at that really strong, formal, stage two, creedal, institutional church. And because we're weak at stage two, we're not great at bringing folks from chaos into structure. And that includes troubled young people as well. Let me give you an example. In our intellectual stage three need to be open-minded and informed, we like to explain that stories like Noah and the flood is a myth. We know from historical study that was influenced by the Babylonian epic tale of the Gilgamesh. So the Genesis story of the ark is not an actual historical account of saving all the creatures of the world and certainly the entire world was not covered in water. Meanwhile, the four-year-olds down in our preschool or Sunday school, all they want to do is just play with the animals in the boat and color the rainbow. 
What I'm saying is it's important to let children learn at their own level, their own stage, without us imposing our critical thinking upon them before they're ready for it. And that's something we try to be careful with in our education system here. Now later, when they grow into adolescence, maybe go through confirmation, and they're doing their questioning, some of them will declare they're agnostics. They may say, I don't believe in God. And when they do, we will say to them, Welcome to the questions. Now tell me about the God you don't believe in, because I probably don't believe in that God either. People live through these different stages at different times in their life in every religion. There are peaceful, inclusive, stage four mystical Jews and Christians and Muslims and Buddhists, whatever, and humanists. There are also people in every faith tradition who are ready to argue and fight, who want to convert others to their way, who will conduct a holy war at the drop of a hat because they have never moved beyond stage two religion. I believe that the true spiritual journey of any path is ultimately stage four mysticism. But we have to travel through all the other stages first. We can't just jump to four. You can't reach four without that chaotic energy that you get from stage one. Without some structure and boundaries that were given by stage two. And certainly you can't get to four if you don't go through the questioning phase of stage three. And this spiritual journey is not a straight line. It's more like a spiraling learning. And at some level, we have to recognize that none of these stages is the result of our own efforts alone. But there is a spirit deep within us, constantly calling us to new awareness and consciousness. And you also need a community made up of people who are all over the map on this road but who want to support each other. And perhaps, even when we reach stage four, that ultimate mystical communal goal, what we will learn is that it's just the beginning. Amen.